the past two years are now waking up. Everybody and their grandmas that bought in at 68, 67,000, you know, last cycle are starting to wake up again. And they're, uh, you know, all about Web3 once more. So we figure we'll, uh, we'll open up a space. Uh, welcome to, to the aquarium. My name is Acti. And by the way, we, uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to bring up anyone that wants to pitch in and wants to chat with us and tell us how they see this new cycle that I believe is uh, is just getting started you know like uh, if uh, if if Bitcoin is respecting its tradition, you know, traditionally before the halvening, and we're about what fifty days or so from from the halvening, it does see this uh, this uptick. After that, there's um, there's a small correction, and then the, the full bull uh, the full bull bull run is uh, is going to be upon us. So uh, everyone's kind of waiting for that, looking forward to it. So. Oh, we're going to try to see how is this cycle going to be different? What's What have people learned? Have they learned anything? Are they looking at it at, uh, um, from, from a different perspective? Or have, have they learned nothing? Or maybe maybe some people are just, uh, you know, uh, sitting on the sidelines still, waiting uh, even for more confirmation that the market is, uh, is in an uptrend already. For me, this uh, this has been a confirmation enough, you know, for for the full uh, for the full year of 2023, the market's been uh, in an uptrend, you know, from from that low in January to about what was it like 16, 17 thousand, uh, all the way back up, and now with the approval of the ETFs, with all this positive sentiment going around, um, I was reading some articles. It, it, it seems that the um, the retailers, you know, the, the normies, as uh, some people like to call them, are not back yet. They're not buying. But there are a lot of uh, institutions, there are a lot of uh, funds that are getting into it. There's a lot of people that are excited about it. So uh, if I have to, well, not guess, but if I have to uh, think about what's different this cycle, I think we've learned a lot. I think a lot more people are experienced a lot more people have made a lot of money still you know last cycle and some of those people didn't give up some of those people went into the uh, bear market building they've created their own protocols they've created their own communities they've created their own systems they've sort of built out their um their whole thing around around the web3 space and not just bitcoin but as uh, as you all know, you know Bitcoin is the first. Bitcoin is the the big dog. Bitcoin is the one that is is leading the charge, sort of. So uh, we're we're all excited about it. Um, I got uh, I got Glenn on stage as well. If anybody else wants to jump in and uh, speak their piece, you know you're uh, you're very welcome. Uh, Glenn, how, how are you? How's it going? Can you hear me all right? Am I coming through? Yeah. Yeah, you're coming through great. Actually, uh, yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin baby. It's, uh, I think, surprised us all, you know, throw the uh, uh, history books in the bin, you know, all my months of studying uh, past uh, four-year cycles. Uh, it's not played out that way, and it looks like, you know, we could have a ATH higher than the, uh, the last uh, bull market ATH before they even halving, which is sort of crazy. I mean, I take ETFs have had a play in this and people didn't realize how sort of popular they would be and it's just putting more buy pressure on. I think maybe the miners were seeing what ETF would do and normally they'd dump before a Bitcoin halving and they haven't done and, you know, why sell now when, you know, 12 to 18 months it could be 100k plus. So, and I think, you know, retail investors and institutional investors you know, and, you know, the US dollar's pretty weak uh, and the inflation we had, so it's just a huge interest. And I think, yeah, we're getting more people into crypto and uh, through the ETFs and uh, they don't need to sort of hold wallets and stuff. But, uh, yeah, it really surprised me last year when it shot up to 43 so early and then 53, like you said, a week or so ago, and then 62.8, I think it is at now. It's just, uh, yeah really surprised a lot of people and some people might be pulling their hair out if they're holding stable and have missed sort of uh, opportunities but there's still you know 10 20 30 x in the alts i think the alts haven't caught up with bitcoin yet as well so when bitcoin went all last year if you remember sort of november december um it took three or four weeks for the alts to 
jump up 510x so i'd be maybe holding some altcoins but not financial advice but um yeah when it was at 43 you know i, I thought everyone's thinking it's going to go back down to 30 so it won't actually do that and and uh, so i held on to uh most of my altcoins and yeah uh but missed some of the pump sort of uh offering liquidity and things and so it's half stable and half in alts but uh yeah i mean bitcoin's just you know marching ahead and eth so uh, it'll be a great discussion today with everyone uh around that and you know what sort of part etfs have played in this and the sort of geopolitical um world we live in now as well you know people want sort of security when there's uh sort of you know inflation and uh, high food prices and uh, so there's all sorts of uh, stuff we could discuss today of why bitcoin is doing this before the halving and yeah i'll pass it back to you actually on your thoughts yeah well i i know you're uh you're not big in uh, into fiat and uh, like you said you know I, I i didn't see this coming i was talking to a friend of mine just um a couple of days ago and once bitcoin shot up a bit i told him it's like ah oh, i i should have had like uh, my lungs open and all this and then uh, you know yesterday again i was like oh damn you know i missed it again and now today i'm like okay well no more longing you know we're, we're just riding the wave i got my my little bag uh, stored nicely you know i've been looking at it yesterday took a look at it today it's looking nice what can i say you know it's i, I think a lot of people have uh, had this mentality where they have dca'd uh, during the, the bear market you know and uh, at this point like if you bought bitcoin anytime last year you're up like even if you bought it last week if you bought it last month you're you're already up now i'm i'm a big advocate of just holding your bitcoin that's what i tell everyone like even like my family my friends everyone that i talk to i i try to tell them you don't need to sell it like if you're if you're investing in it um buy as much as you're comfortable buying and you don't need to sell it like by the time you'll get interested in it you'll get to learn how you can leverage against it you'll get to learn how how you can use it without actually selling your bitcoin and it's it's a great store of value i'm just looking at the charts now it's briefly touched like 63,000 right now actually past 63,000 to 632 so i don't know where this is going to stop maybe it's, it's like you said then maybe we're breaking the all-time high alive you know who the hell knows because um by reading some of the articles and looking at what some of these exchanges are saying and some of the analytics coming uh, out of people that are way smarter than us it seems that there's not a lot of liquidity still on exchanges so um it, it might be just uh, you know a whales playing around and pumping the price but I, I cannot hate it. I I gotta love it. You know, it's uh, we've been waiting for this moment for a few years now. So it's uh, everyone's in a happy place. Everybody that has some Bitcoin, everybody is going around uh, telling you, you know, telling I told you so to everyone. You know, <laughs> everyone is just going around uh, waiting, waiting to see what's gonna happen and what's gonna what's gonna come come off this thing that just doesn't stop like i when, when i started speaking just a minute ago it was under 63 and now it's at 63.3 so I'm, I'm i'm loving the pump i'm respecting it i uh, i hope that like, like i said in the beginning i hope a lot more people learned a few lessons during these past two years and they are going to be cautious in how they invest they're going to manage their risk accordingly they're going to start diving a little bit more into the DeFi side of it too you know they're, they're not just going to um, take a look um, buy and forget about it which is actually not not a bad strategy you know we're we're seeing some analysts with um predictions for the bitcoin price in 2030 i think it was it was either for 2030 or 2032 something like that and the low ball of it was around uh, 300,000 or something like that and the high price that they were approximated was above a million so uh, if you believe that kind of narrative if you believe it really is a store of value if you think this uh, this great tech that we've all come to love can go to you know tremendous heights and I'm one of those believers you know some people call call us maxis some people call, call us different names but when when you look at where the market's going, when you look at what 
other financial systems are doing and when you look at governments trying to implement their own cbdc's when you're looking at at the macro level of things there's no way to to not notice bitcoin and we've had a couple of great minds on our spaces before people that are far more intelligent and smart and have done more research than we have and we've even had people that were completely shunning bitcoin in the beginning we've had people that were completely against it that once they dove a little bit deeper uh, they became like full on maxis like uh, I, I was talking to uh, a guy I met at one of these live conferences and uh, he's a financial analyst and that this was the case for him where uh, he was a non-believer in the beginning he didn't trust it he didn't like it and then after learning what it is about and diving a lot deeper he's uh, yeah he became sort of a maxi right now to the point that which he's wrote, written books about it he's starting his own fund that's um, solely his sole purpose is to actually just um, sponsor projects that are building on top of Bitcoin or using Bitcoin for some utility or, or anything like that. So a, a lot of people are are, are not are no longer on the sidelines. I think they're um, they're they're seeing the trend. They're loving the trend. And before I see, I see Noah's also on stage. I'll pass it to him. I see Fidgetal is also here. I don't know if your connection is okay, Fidgetal, but we've almost touched. Hey, we just hit six, we just hit sixty four. Oh, there we go, Mr. Dallas. Welcome to the stage, sir. Yeah, we we just hit the sixty four mark. So we started the broadcast at around sixty two thousand. We're at sixty four thousand now. You know, and who knows where we'll be when when we end? Maybe it'll go crashing down again. Maybe it'll hit. hit 70,000. Maybe we'll, we'll break the all-time high right here and everybody gets to celebrate together. But uh, I, I want to hear from, from everybody else. I, I don't know if Fidgetal's connection is okay. If you're uh, if you're okay with your connection, Fiji, just jump in at any time. Dallas, how, how's this how's this cycle going to be different? Any, uh, any approximations? Any, I don't know, any predictions? Anything that you feel strongly about? Or is it just more of the same and fathers will fud and believers will believe? Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying trying to figure out the best way to attack it. I mean, it's definitely different. Um, you know, all the prior cycles were, you know, most of it was like, you know, I mean, it depends how how long you guys have been here. You know, I know I was talking about this earlier in another space where, you know, I think I first bought Bitcoin was like probably 350 bucks or something like that. And the run up in 17 going to like 20 was like world changing, right? And then, you know, you have things flush out because there's too much leverage and people going crazy because of like ICOs or whatever. And then the next time we get to 20K, a couple of years later, it's like, there's just like nobody's heart rate is even up. No one cares. People aren't texting you. And then we start, you know, going towards, um, you know, towards 69. And that was like, oh my God, like, you know, new paradigm. And then we, we all know kind of how things played out from there. And yeah, I mean, I think it is different because like, you know, th I mean, there's always going to be sort of unexpected things, no doubt. Um, but, you know, the last cycle you had, you know, FTX sort of like as a big player, like fraudulently not passing flows into Bitcoin like they should. You had, you know, the Fed just pull out all this liquidity and then raise rates like crazy. And then like Luna and Celsius and all these different people with big holdings of Bitcoin blow up and become four sellers and just all these cascading things. And now you know, so much of the supply was still held through all that, right? And so those the people who did that, which is probably many of us here, obviously have a much, you know, longer term view. And so we're back at 69. And, you know, if we're at 80, that things don't really change or 90 or whatever. I think everybody who really gets Bitcoin knows the game is just like very much starting. And, you know, now you mix in what's happening with the ETFs. And so, you know, there's so much like just, there's so much more of like a passive, continuous buy that's going to come from that. And it's, it's people who, you know, again, are like long-term view buying it each, you know, each Monday or each quarter or whatever, however, they're sort of allocating capital and they're just, they're just holding it. And like, you know, at, at, at worst, they'll probably sort of rebalance. And then, you know, the other catalyst that's yet to come, but I think there's like a, I think a 250 to 80 day kind of window after the ETFs are approved that has to get um out there is is, is the options and so uh, you know i got educated by a few people recently just that what what's going to happen with options on the etf right so price will be up and people will start to um you know put on puts right and so what happens when you do that and you're essentially kind of you know hedging yourself in case bitcoin goes down 
like the the person on the other side of that actually has to go into the market, you know, and acquire the Bitcoin and and hold its spot, right? Um, to be able to, you know, take the other side of that. And so what that does is like it dampens volatility, and I think that's really good in some ways, right? Because I think Bitcoin's always going to have its like upside volatility, right? You have you know, super scarce asset. So many people in the world just don't even know that yet, haven't figured that out yet. And and like you guys mentioned, a lot of people are allocated, but even the ones who are allocated who, who you know, more wealthier people, they're very, they're allocated in a really small way, right? They're kind of just barely dipping their toe in. Like almost nobody has a meaningful percentage of their net worth in Bitcoin unless they've been here for a while uh, or they're, you know, they fully get it and are all in. So yeah, I just think, I think there's going to be an overextension. Like there always is, there's going to be some kind of, you know, pullback, but I think it won't be as dramatic of like a 70, 80% kind of thing. Like before, I mean, unless we just parabolically go to like unprecedented levels and then we come back down to what, what are still crazy levels from here. But, um, but yeah, I, I think it's going to be very different and almost this like casual, consistent kind of grind upward with pullbacks that are smaller than kind of the much more early, volatile days of bitcoin i i, I gotta agree with that sentiment you know it, it, it you're sort of right it kind of right on the money the dust did settle you know because uh all these uh you know you mentioned ftx you've mentioned all these other um, you know exchanges and everything like that that went under and a lot of projects going under and all these other, other people that weren't uh, in it for the long run, maybe, or doing stuff that was not above board. Uh, I think we, we've had enough time now to sort of brush over things. I think people had time to sort of digest what happened there, you know. Now, maybe uh, here's a lesson for everyone that had their money on FTX, you know, because uh, if you had Bitcoin and you held it on FTX, you are entitled, I, I believe the, the US-based customers are going to be entitled to get uh, their Bitcoin back or part of it, but the rate at which they're getting it back is whatever Bitcoin was at the beginning of January last year which is basically at the all time low. So here's a lesson for everyone in the audience. You know, if you're holding Bitcoin, how about you go and, and learn a little bit more about it and actually uh, hold it yourself, you know, like buy, buy a non-custodial ledger well, wallet, you know, not shilling ledger or anything like that on, on stage here. Hold it yourself, self custody, learn a little bit more about the tech, you know, see why we are all about taking control back of your finance, of your life, of your attention and everything like that. Because if you held on to your Bitcoin, you know, one, well, uh, you wouldn't lost it in, in FTX and two, maybe you would have forgotten about it. And instead of that 16,000 that you're going to get off uh, of those uh, forced sellers, you know, as Dallas pointed out, maybe you'd be at a 3x or 4x from there. So I uh, really, really, you know, uh, I'm... Uh, I'm hoping all these people have learned a few things. I got I got Tim up on stage. Hey Tim, Tim's uh, Tim's uh, well. I I want to call him a friend. We we've met up in uh, in Vienna here at a, at a nice little uh, block and wine event. You know, he's uh, he's he's only half degen. Let me pre preface this with this. You know, Tim's actually a great guy. So, <laughs> hey, hey Tim, how's it going? How are you? Guys. Cycle's gonna be different. <laughs> Um, first of all, I wouldn't consider myself half DGEN. I think that's quite a compliment, but I think I'm still like a full DGEN, <laughs> if you consider my, my on-chain place. Um, well, first of all, I fully agree with everything you, you guys just said, and hi to you all. Um, I think right now, what we are seeing right now is basically, it's actually Wall Street bidding. Um, so it's actually Wall Street, in my opinion, um, obviously bidding and buying every Bitcoin they can get, um, which is obviously pumping Bitcoin up super high, um, maybe short term, even to new all time highs. Um, I mean, the problem here is that many, many people will FOMO in, right? Like usual, um, when, when prices are getting higher and higher. So. There is there's two things basically. So first of all, it's a super high risk to be completely out of the market. And I think many, many people are sidelined right now. Especially people who think they or or let's say who are right curving the market. So I personally see lots of people who think they are too intelligent um being sidelined because they expected a retrace and you know, maybe like 30-ish again and stuff like that. 
I think it can still happen. Um, everything can still happen. But you should never be fully sidelined um, when bull market is, is coming, right? Um, besides that, so yeah, there's basically Wall Street bidding a lot. Um, I think that's not going to stop. And I also agree fully with everything what you just said, that every one of us should self-custody our own Bitcoin. Because at the end of the day, not your keys, not your coins. Um, that's like the number one rule in crypto. Um, so take care, actually, I would say, because Bitcoin itself is getting more and more centralized. So you guys, especially every one of you, like the real DJs, you should care for your decentral, let's say, you should care for a decentralized place, right? Um, so keep your coins safe. Um, don't let them, I don't know, on some, on some random exchanges, because like the space is still super volatile and super fragile. Um, so make sure you're safe at all times and don't over risk. That's what I, I should say right now. Well, Tim, I, I completely agree with that. And as you were talking, it went to 61,000 and now back at 62.3. So, uh, you know, we're from one minute to the next, you know, it's full blown euphoria. It's like, oh my God, 64,000, we're going to a new all time high to probably liquidating a couple of million dollars in shorts right, in longs right there, you know. So w when you say, you know, it's, it's probably manipulated or it's probably artificially inflated, does that stem from sort of your financial background? Is this something that, uh, you know, these big, large market makers would do sort of to get, to, to get people hooked and get people uh, onboarded? Because right now it doesn't look like retail is here. So who are they trying to grab? Who are they trying to, to sort of hook with, with, with this fake pump is what I'm trying to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty hard question, to be honest. I think, honestly, no one knows. Um, obviously, it is a like market manipulation in both in both ways, both sides, um, to the up, but also to, to the downside. Um, yes, there is definitely people with interest, especially hedge funds, um, also VCs who are taking... Let's say, let's say they're interested in, in market manipulation, also obviously market makers. So there's lots of people who are actually benefiting from the high volatility. And at the end of the day, what are retail people actually betting on? It's not like they're not buying Bitcoins, right? Usually they're like more deep and they're like, whenever you see somebody playing with Robin Hood and stuff, they're buying meme coins and stuff um, because they want to be rich as fast as possible. So I guess the intelligent people are going more and more risk off, maybe even, you know, like um, taking some profits, obviously, um, while retail is actually following in. But the hard thing still is, if you're going risk off, you should always, you should never um, put all your stake off the table, right? Because it's crypto and crypto obviously moves exponentially. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell. I think no one knows exactly where we will go from here. Um, we can only expect it. And yes, there are many, many entities, many people who are definitely benefiting from volatile market faces, I would say. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I like it. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm benefiting from the pump more than the volatility, to be honest. But I, I respect it. You know, there's people out there that live off of these things. You know, they, the, the more volatile it is, the better they do. You know, whether it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think um, many people are overcomplicating that. I recently talked to a, let's say, a fund. And they were basically asking, okay, um, if we launch that token, how high can we pump it? So um, I think many people are overcomplicating it. At the end of the day, everyone wants to make profits in the space. Um, crypto is here for most people um, to make money, obviously, um, to speculate on. And, well, you shouldn't overcomplicate it. There is lots of different interests and everyone wants a, well, a, a piece of the cake, right? Well, of course, you know, everyone wants a piece of the cake and what we're trying to do is, well, not trying, we've been doing it successfully for the past couple of years is just create news and education for people, right? That's, that's all you can do. These are the tools that you must have if you want to 
be successful in this space. You know, it's not it, it, what do they say. It's it's not timing the market. It's time in the market, right? The, the longer you stay stick around, the long the longer you're around, the the better you're probably gonna do. You know, and this is what I was getting at in the, in the beginning. You know, a lot of people that chose to onboard to the Web three space and not necessarily become investors in Bitcoin or investors in Ethereum or anything like that, but they learn how to code, uh, Solidity or something like that. Or instead of being an, an account manager for a Web2 company, they went on to a Web3 company. You know, I, I know people that did stuff as, as little as being community managers or, you know, something trivial that once you do onboard into the Web3 space, you'll notice that the pay is better. You'll notice that the people tend to be a little smarter. You'll notice that, you know, people are more serious. And it does have to do a lot with the fact that there's a lot of money involved. So people do want you to be very professional and they, you know, they, they want, everyone wants a, a fancy product. And I mean, what you were saying there, you know, with the, <laughs> let's launch your token and see how far we can pump it. That's, yeah, a little bit too degeny, you know, <laughs> if you ask me. And uh, I know that not everybody is uh, above board and not everybody is uh, sort of... Uh, looking for the best solution to sort of make everyone money they're just looking to increase their bags you know it, it doesn't matter how much bitcoin you have enough is just a little bit more than what you have right so uh it's uh, we're trying to teach people be responsible uh, self-custody this is what you should learn about and what what i've told everyone even from from the start is you don't need to learn everything about everything in web3 you just need to find a niche that you and well, a sub niche of the web3 space you know you can uh, love nfts that's fine you know go and learn about nfts and create profile pictures get involved with the art that's beautiful sure do that you want to learn about DeFi? that's great you know decentralization can be explained to a 12 year old in in just a few steps right the finance part you might need to go to some classes i don't know but still you you'll you'll do very well if you do that if you want to learn coding there are free courses online if you want to do anything just dive a little deeper try to allocate a little bit of time every day and if you do this you'll find out that you you'll you'll get better exponentially i've known people that they dm me from from time to time it's like hey man you know, I, I took your advice uh, about a year and a half ago and now i'm working for such and such company and they're paying me such and such and i never thought like this was possible or whatever it's like yeah, yeah it, it, well we're in a cutting edge industry here you know it, it, sure we're of uh, you know it's 12, 15 years into it already, but it's still just emerging right now. It's still just mm, catching its form. It's not really fully at a place where we can say, okay, we got Web3 nailed down. You know, we got the game makers that already put all their assets on chain. You know, we got all the financial institutions on board and everybody's uh, transparent and doing their transactions on chain and it can be audited easily and all this sort of stuff. Well, no, but we're getting there, you know, and yeah, not everything is is, is digital, right? <laughs> I don't know if, if your connection is better digital. If you want to jump in and give us your take on why this, uh, this cycle might be different, Maybe give us a little bit of what you learned. Yeah, we can we can hear you. So, what what stood with you for these past two years of, of bear market? It um it keeps on coming out. Uh, I'm trying to find a connection. Can you hear yeah, me now? Yeah, you were a little choppy when you started. Talking. Okay, there yeah, we go. We can hear. Uh, perfect. There we go. Okay, I, I beat the machine. How's it going, guys? So, uh, um, you you guys can all thank me for this pump. Um. I decided that uh, <laughs> actually finally launched a couple of projects and uh, decided to, to go to Southeast Asia. So I'm, I'm in Vietnam looking at Cambodia right now, uh, sacrificing my body for this space, getting bit by mosquitoes at 1 in the morning or 12.30 in the morning. So uh, good morning, guys. Um, but uh, can't complain. What, what, an, what an interesting, I won't say incredible, what an interesting day uh, across the board. Um, Love the take so far. I actually posted earlier, I posted some some hype tweets. Um, this is my first bull on, on crypto Twitter. Um, uh, it's my, I guess, fourth bull in, in general. Uh, and I'm really interested in the kind of the convergence. And, and I chose the title, uh, Why is this cycle different? Because it is. Um, for, for a number of reasons, from, from technical perspectives, uh, we've never had a, a bull that, that was not in a QE, a quantitative easing cycle, um, which you would expect, i.e. there's not just free money being thrown around. Uh, 
there's been expectations there. Um, but the, the most interesting part is during this bear, other, uh, think about like Polygon and, and other uh, chains that have been building heavily in, in the tech sector, um, while slowly changing from a speculative, a purely, well, this is my opinion, don't take it for what it is, but a, a purely speculative uh, ecosystem with, with firm believers to uh, a, a trickle-down effect. Um, and so for me personally, I'm really, really interested in, uh, as I posted earlier, uh, said, uh, the, the, and the cup floweth over. So for me, the, the most interesting part of this phase is uh, what does this mean for quote-unquote alts? What does this mean for, uh, for ETH? Uh, is, well, we're watching it happen, right? It's, it's, it's matching, but, but it's being outsized by Bitcoin at the, to at the, uh, at the moment um, because I believe, obviously, the Bitcoin ETFs, we're going to be seeing ETH ETFs, uh, rumors of FTX ETFs, I mean, uh, uh, XRP ETFs, FTX ETFs, that'd be hilarious. Um, so for me, I don't know about you guys, I'm really interested, but I was talking to Noah earlier, um, and there's a balance, right? There's the excitement of watching it happen, but also the reality of knowing it, the inevitability. Um, for people like me and Noah, and you guys up here, we all are, are invested to the point where whether it's 100K now, 100K in six months, 100K in a year and a half, half a million in, in a year and a half, we have conviction that the inevitability is there. So it's not about the end goal, it's really about the journey. So that's what I'm really watching right now, personally, and I'd love to hear from the rest of the panel, is what are you interested in, in terms of kind of uh, milestones and impacts um, that never existed in the previous bulls? And how do you guys think we're going to see trickle down? So, you know, from Bitcoin to ETH to, uh, you know, non-EVM Solana to new chains taking, uh, taking market share, whether it be Sui or Say. Um, and then, of course, uh, for all my JPEG lovers, how this flows over into uh, alternative asset uh, groups, whether it be NFTs, whether it be RWAs. Um, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. Uh, Tim, your hands up. I'd uh, love to hear your perspective. And anybody in the audience who's, who's here, nice to see you guys. Mark, I see you there. I'm really interested in what's happening uh, with you. I, I love your product and uh, I, I love your drive. So uh, Pixel in the audience, I'd uh, love to hear from any of you guys. Um, if I can do it, you can do it. But Tim, what's up, brother? Um, first of all, I think, or I hope for more real life use cases, such as the tokenization of not only real estate, but well, literally everything. So RWA, um, I do think it's quite hard to roll it out, especially because of re regulations and stuff. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to tell right now what's going to be really changing in 2024 when it comes to crypto um we do have like we already see some really decent use cases uh, for example in ai um decentralized gpu mining and stuff that's like super interesting why because it's it actually has a huge use case um so that's one thing for me and well besides that i hope that real life use cases rwa is going to emerge I don't know how far this will go this year because it's kind of hard, especially when it comes to regulations, like I said. But um, that would be my, yes, my, my favorite point um, because that's what everyone since I'm in crypto, I'm in crypto since uh, 2017, everyone back then was like, okay, we are going to change this and that. But it's obviously it's like super hard, not only from a technical, but from a um regulatory and also from an economical point of view so you have to combine all these three points to make something really usable um in in legacy tech i guess a lot of people are, are waiting for uh, you know better use of tokenization of real world assets how we're going to see it, where is it going to pop up first, is it going to be as seamless as everybody hopes, 
those are those are some questions that you know uh, they're hard to hard to answer. So uh, let me pass it over to to Pixel. We got him up on stage here. Uh, what's up, sir? Hey, I, I love this dialogue. It's uh, literally right where my head's at right now. I'm actually considering uh, leaving a 30 year plus career in cybersecurity and going like all in on a real world asset uh, play. Um, and it would be creating a, an entire token economy uh, to address stuff that comes out of the earth. I'll leave it at that because I got to keep it a little bit quiet. But um, but it's, it's, are you but, talking about un, un, unrealized? Pixel, by the way, morning, brother, or evening, yeah. whatever it is. Are you talking about unrealized, uh, uh, un, unrealized or or uh, unearthed minerals? Y yes, and not yet earthed minerals okay. that can be earthed. Uh, I'll, I mean, you did the math. I guess there's there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the out of the ground, but uh, in this case, it's uh, minerals and, and and other things too, but primarily things like lithium. Um, uh, where the, the demand is so crazy that even you know Bill Gates and, and Elon Musk are competing for uh, for for resources to get access to it. But but the idea is like um, you know you, you can acquire a mine, but then uh, you have to operationalize it to to extract the value out of it to get your your revenue flowing. So how do you front load um, a project like that where you have to have all the the earth movers and, and extraction and, and sorting and testing and all the stuff you need to to successfully mine? Well, crypto, like a typical raise, just like you might do with an NFT or an IDO, you drop a token and then the token is tied to either like the balance sheet of the organization uh, and its revenues with extreme transparency, or it's tied uh, or it has additional functionality like utility where you can actually buy uh, the minerals coming out as a buyer, as a global buyer, right? And so for an international market like lithium, highly competitive, stuck in the middle of geopolitical tensions between the East and the West and the revolcanization of chips and chip wars and all that, um, you have to look at this and say, well, for traditional financing gets very tricky. So crypto might be very interesting because I can then tokenize that. Um, and the question I have for the audience uh, and anybody can help me out is I'm trying to do my due diligence on this and, and I can do that on the mining side and I can do tokenomics and I can launch projects, that, you know, and find money too, right? But what I don't know how to do yet is successfully tie a token to a unit of measurement that is the real world asset. Um, and I'm looking for just broad stroke advice and also specific advice of so there's a personality or somebody that's done this before or a legal person to kind of get started. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's different types of verification that will be needed, transparency. Um, audit is is that what you know something I look at, uh, I, I'm trying to look into as well um, so I'm you know this is where I'm at in my career and this conversation we're having just to kind of bring it full circle is, is fascinating to me because you know I think I think there's this last stack I uh, stat I heard digital was like uh, by the year 2035 RWA assets will you know will be worth 13 uh, no one what was it uh, one point no 13 trillion I believe if I remember that stat right um, and, you know, 2035, that's not very far. That's just like a decade from now, right? So um, how do we go from zero-ish to, uh, you know, in purses and Ferraris and Rolexes to things like a mining a economy um, and an operation that, you know, itself will be a $13 billion uh, endeavor, you know, if we succeed? So, Pixel, you've come to the right place. Um, and I'm happy I called you out. Um <laughs> Uh, if, if you weren't being ironic, and by the way, I apologize if you hear noises in the background. I am literally getting eaten up by mosquitoes, and there's tuk-tuks uh, driving by in, in, in the river. Um, but it is what it is. Uh, so f super fascinated with what you're talking about. If, if you haven't been following, uh, I, I've been heavy in the RWA space, but not because it's a gimmick, but because uh, two years ago I was dealing with uh, Australian... Uh, Australian mining companies, uh, uh, the government of Palau, talking about um, uh, unmined but in-ground uh, gold and other minerals and try to create uh, a, a global uh, uh, permissionless exchange for, for commodities globally. Um, to answer your question, I know this is specific, guys, so I apologize if it's boring, but the first thing you want to do is, uh, and none of this is legal or financial advice, but... Uh, have you have you looked into whether it, it's bankable? Can you get can you get the assets papered? 
Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm muting. Um, I, I believe so. So there's different aspects to this, uh, and I have some ignorance here, but uh, are you speaking about like carbon offset paper? Are you talking about um, um, like some kind of uh, acreage no, whether, that converts whether, to... Whether a, go ahead. Whether a bank will issue, uh, whether a bank will issue notes uh, against the the so how in ground assets are assessed is um, there's direct uh, uh, direct availability meaning it, it can be mined pretty easily uh, but it, it just isn't because of the cost of setting up the mining and and the rigs and, and the mechanics and and the labor and all that stuff but there's banking especially in Switzerland that will provide notes so you can borrow against uh, proportions of those uh, in ground assets or unrealized assets so that would be phase one. Um, the easiest way uh, would be to get traditional finance to support debt against uh, or credit against those assets. And then you can tokenize the debt. Uh, you can look at, actually look at the Forge, which is an NFT project that's being launched, which is uh, tokenizing real estate uh, debt. So institutional real estate debt then tokenized and uh, provided to uh, NFT holders or participants. But what we're really just talking about is is uh, definable assets or unrealized assets and the risk associated with it. Then tokenizing it is, of course, the legal questions as Tim was talking about. But that's that's what I found to be the first steps. Um, and then, of course, if if, a, if an institution won't won't paper it, i.e., give you uh, credit papers or, or, or debt papers against it, uh, then you come, you're, you're entering into a more speculative uh, uh, area. But the idea of unlocking uh, unrealized liquidity, uh, which is kind of the goal of RWAs, I believe is the future. Uh, I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this. I didn't know we were going there. But uh, if we are creating a global uh, economy, then we're also tokenizing or, or realizing all value across all assets ideally yeah um i, I want to hear others too and tim, tim especially uh you i came in late like literally just before fictional brought me up so i wasn't privy to the earlier discussion but um i i'm i'm, I'm now with you fictional on, on what you're asking yeah a lot of this stuff is amazing because it's like hard rock lithium which like grab a bulldozer break some rocks and your buyers will come to you to pull it away because it's so much easier than like trying to do it in arizona in the united states we have to like soaking in salts and bringing it up from the deep earth and it takes like two years to get a mine run running this is like hyper fast stuff right so i've, I've done some dyor so it sounds like those options like swiss banking and and tokenizing the debt would make sense but um there are reasons why this uh this organization tried both uh, public and private financing and did not find success um and i'm not sure what those are so i'd love to like talk to you and, and maybe tim offline i don't want to like take up your whole space on on this but um but i find it fascinating too at a broader perspective because at the end of the day like energy is economy like in a digital world energy is everything right so i'm also looking at um creating entire verticals where you go from earth to energy to bitcoin mining back to the government and the local people uh specifically in africa um and that would be a way to keep all these uh chinese and russian folks going in there and just um pretty much like uh you know, not meaning to offend any that might be in the audience, but um, th they take a lot of advantage of the people and the local governments. Um, and the idea here would be to like get them self sufficient via Bitcoin mining and, and sovereignty, self banking, and all the things that go along with it, but start with what they already have in the ground uh, things like coal, natural gas, um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Ab absolutely, by the way. Um and I'm, I'm going to get a little esoteric, and then I'll, I'll bring I'll bring it home real quick, and then I'll, we'll, we will go to Tim. And I hope I just sent an invite to Lucas, because um, uh, what we're really, really, really talking about is we're, we're talking about unlocking liquidity, um, meaning value that exists. Just there aren't mechanics usually because larger industries don't want that to be unlocked because they control those industries. Um, that's really what we're talking about across the board is we're fighting institutions, right? By, by definition. Um, and at the core where we start with that is, is what is money, right? And, and if you break down, it's really just time and energy, right? So uh, I foresee re really tokenizing time, 
tokenizing true value, right? At the end of the day, Bitcoin is valuing the time and energy related to mining Bitcoin. Uh, it, it, if we strip it down, we think about them in, in, the, in the sense of dollars. I'm, I'm here in, in Vietnam. We took a, a boat, a tuk-tuk boat tour yesterday, and we saw, uh, besides for people living in, in, in uh, you know, abject squalor to a degree, uh, we're also talking to Philipp uh, people from the Philippines who, for the last couple of years, have been making their living off of play-to-earn gaming. Um, at one point, it was, I believe it was around 80% of the Philippine uh, 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 income revenue was from play-to-earn gaming. Facts. Um, and I, I was talking to a, a guy named G-Bunny who who's, uh, was on the team before, and my comment to him was, I literally texted him, I'm like, you must live like a king out here because you are not bound to your local economy. You are not bound to the constructs of, of, of the physical locale and you're, you're operating in crypto, right? And they're operating the same, they're, they're playing the same game as us in, in, in first world country, but in, in a place where I think it's like, I think it's like 40 to one I'm spending right now. And, and I'm just throwing money at people just because I can't, it's, it's nice to be able to, 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 to help the economy. But that's what really what we're talking about is we're talking about uh, egal egalitarian approach to value, which is human. It, it's not separate by, by physical boundaries. It's not separated by whichever government issues, whatever currency is at, is at any given time. And I wanted Lucas to come up because Lucas is focusing on some really, really cool stuff. And welcome, Andrew. Welcome, Lucas. Uh, and Pixel, thanks for coming up. Uh, I see Panda in the audience. Better get your ass up here, motherfucker. Uh, love to hear your your thoughts on this because you're a strange one and I love you. Um, but Lucas is trying to decentralize uh, uh, um, uh, utilities. Like, why do we have utility companies? Why why can't we control and have efficient access to energy, to water, to utilities, um, and and the the economic possibilities of distributing that 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 value that is theirs? It's yours, but. You haven't had the chance to access it from a decentralized and, and, and uh, for lack of a better word, a, a, a autonomous way. Uh, there's so much value that really reflects why crypto is doing what it is. Um, and so, Lucas, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, A, how you see these kinds of things playing out with this new cycle um, and kind of your approach to, I guess... But we haven't really called it before, but you're trying to play in RWAs as well. And good morning, brother. Good morning, and I hope I hope you're having a great time in Vietnam. Um, yeah, Vietnam is is a is a is a you know like a great watershed around a river. Um, it's it's uh, I don't know like oh, well I'm too I'm too ignorant to dig into there. But what do I think about this new cycle? I mean, I think that you know I I think that we need. Um, I think that we need to think about what accounting is uh, to tell a story. You go to a bank, you walk up to a teller, they tell you a story, you know, and it's broken down into numbers because that's something that we can agree on. And, and you can tell a story starting at, at the first of a story. You can start at the end and count backwards. And, and uh, you know, we also talk about checks and balances in the United States. We need the same thing in accounting. You need somebody who's starting at the beginning and telling a story. You need somebody who's starting at the end and coming and coming back. How about is that like? I'll give me a break there before I go on. Or is or no? Car carry on. Uh, uh, but but yeah, I guess just for a moment, what do you mean by in accounting? What, what are the problems that that you think need to be? Uh, cleaned up, and how does how does crypto or blockchain or uh, or, or Web three address that? Well, sure, and we talk about we talk about fiat and the inflation of money, but but uh, it takes starting at the beginning to be able to inflate a money. If you're going to have something static, it needs to be a financial instrument, which is that notion of going into the future um, and 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 begins to open up debt. So I, I guess I just bring that up because when you say, uh, when you ask about this new cycle, I think that, like I look at the Bitcoin and it did not have an L1 and an L2. That was something that came later. You know, then you have Ethereum uh, that comes along and, uh, but, but, you know, what was the problem with Ethereum when it was started is 
Uh, do we see? Did we see Barnes and Noble run to Ethereum and put their put their uh, you know what, what were those cards that you used to get from your grandmother that everybody would lose? You know, like a, a, a chain that had made more sense would have would have been accruing its its value proposition from what it was providing to real world companies like that. Uh, but it did not. Instead, it was the entry level was given at the L one layer. And it just became a, a mirror of the dollar. So I think they will continue. Uh, I think that they will continue to soak up the dollars that we are creating, um, and we're creating a lot of dollars right now. Uh, I think the number, by some counts, is something like one trillion every 134 days. So that money definitely has to go somewhere, and um, uh, or those dollars have to go somewhere. And we have definitely seen in the last year, certainly since the Torres decision, a grooming of blockchains to be able to soak that up. So to, that's where that's where the money comes from, uh, by my take. And and I think that uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all other blockchains are going to see a lot of these dollars get soaked up. Um, and and then to you know like w what do I see. Uh, what do I see as a possible solution for this? I, I go to the the nature of the dollar is, you know, it runs on income tax. It runs on the price movement, how fastly it moves around. So rather, I would like to see us starting to break up the ubiquity of the of value in the world denominated by the dollar by turning to the accounting of our local utilities. Um, we do not start at the first of a month. Uh, for your water bill and say how much water is in the watershed, how many taps are there, how much do, does everyone use. We don't do that at all. We, we instead send everybody a bill at the end of the month and, um, gosh, Vigil, you really put me on the spot here. Good morning. We, we send everybody a bill at the month and there's no, there's no reckoning of what the actual supply of the resource is. So we need to start figuring that out and figuring out what people's share of it are, and then we can begin to create real money, commodity-based money. And I think that's uh, the core of it, Lucas, right? Is as th There's no reason why things need to be generally sweeping. Um, and, and I think we're, we're fine-tuning value, right? Instead of just saying, everybody here in this place uh, we just assume that you're all using this, so we're just going to shoot it out and, and charge uh, a broad uh, fee. Rather, people should have control of their commodities, and that's, that's what Pixel is talking about. Is it, he, he referenced the Chinese? He's, he's referring to the the Silk Road V2 uh, and the and the corruption of of ports and shipping uh, that is crippling uh, Africa. Um, it's happened with the wool in the south of Africa. It's happening with minerals globally, with, with heavy metals, uh, all sorts of things. Um, and giving that back to the people that can can monetize it. Um, I do want to step back for a moment and kind of get back to the. Um, by the way, Lucas, thank you, Pixel. Thank you for for these conversations. I could talk for days about this, um, but we might lose the audience um, for purposes of this kind of auspicious day, evening, whatever it is for you. Um, I wanted to go to Andrew. Welcome, Salamander. Uh, welcome, Andrew. I want to go to Andrew. Um, the title the title of the, the space is Why is this cycle different? So, first of all, uh, how are you feeling right now, Andrew? And <laughs> what do you see is different here? And my most important question is, how do you see trickle-down? The cup floweth over. NFTs, yeah. Yeah. X... Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, investment-wise, I'm feeling great today. <laughs> Personal-wise, uh, you know, some family stuff going on. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> there's a couple things to kind of point to. Um, there's an image that I'm sure folks have seen on CT before. It's it's a great diagram, but it basically kind of overviews how the cycles happen. And actually, um, let me just pull up the Addy for this because there's a resource I found yesterday um, that I think folks will actually benefit from. Let me just get the. Uh, yeah, it's called the Altcoin Season Index. Um, so if you just Google Altcoin Season Index, it lives on blockcenter.net. And <clears throat> it's interesting because I was having a debate with someone yesterday and they were like, we're in alt season. And I'm like, we're not in alt season yet. 
<laughs> and I think what's interesting about this site is what it does is it basically, like if you look at the index, if 75% of the top 50 coins perform better than Bitcoin over the last season, 90 days, it is altcoin season. And so when I look at this right now, um, we are at basically 59 and I can't tell exactly where alt season starts, but we're basically, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of moving away a little bit from Bitcoin. I think we're definitely obviously in Ethereum phase still. And then it looks like we still have a little bit more to go until we hit alt season. I do still think history repeats itself. I do still think we will see trickle down effects. And then, you know, just to add into NFTs, NFTs typically come last. So you have folks that, you know, have now made giant bags um, via alt season and on altcoins. Now they're looking to rotate those. You know, it's no different than buying a Rolex or a Lambo. People want to buy a high profile PFP to kind of signal their, you know, their success. Um, so again, I would always look at kind of NFTs oftentimes following altcoin season. Some of them may though obviously pump. I think what's different about some of the NFTs this season is obviously some of these are now much more utility based. Some of these have their own tokens associated with them. Um, so I think that's something to look at. Um, and then in addition to that, I mean, I, I don't think this is new news for anyone, but like it, it's very likely we're obviously going to break all time highs. I think what will probably happen is you may see more risk adverse folks taking out um, a little bit above all time highs, maybe at five or 10 percent. Um, but but for the most part, I mean, we should exceed those because you have obviously the ETF inflow now happening. Um, I think you have a lot more, let's call crypto curious folks now catching wind of what's happening with Bitcoin because I'm seeing that hit CNBC and major press now. So um, so TLDR, I think history repeats itself. I think we break all time highs um, and we are not in alt season yet. I, fictional. So fictional. I, I, I agree we're not in uh, alt season yet. Although like, you look at some alts like like, it can't be me. I can't sell my Bitcoin. I don't know what it is. Like, this is not the cycle to sell Bitcoin for me, right? I'm just not that guy. But um, I'm afraid to. Literally afraid. Like, I shake in my boots every time I hit the button. I've literally tried to hit the button, like, four times today because I'm looking at, like, DOT. And I don't even care. Like, DOT's getting upgrades. It's going to work. It's I don't even care. But, like, you look at a chart like that right now and you're looking at, like, what's about to happen, it will probably outperform Bitcoin in, like, the next two weeks to a month. But I personally don't care. Like, does that make sense? Like, I think there are alt plays that are like um, great timing right now. I think some of this profit, like that big green boner we just had on Bitcoin, that's going to rotate into some alts. But for me, this is a Bitcoin super cycle, and it's it's for a lot of obvious reasons, and I think also maybe even some non-obvious ones too. Um, I think the overall global meta, like if you zoom all the way out and just look at Earth from outer space, you're like, Bitcoin just looks different this cycle. And you look at, you mentioned NFTs. I'm really like then going down the rabbit hole of ordinals, opcat, and changing Bitcoin functionality. And that's a whole other rabbit hole that I don't know if you want to take the space down or not. But on the ordinals alone, it's a now become an asset on the Bitcoin network which did something weird to Bitcoin. The Satoshi, the unit of um, the base unit, now is no longer the primary asset on the chain. It's the primary utility, but it's not the primary asset. And if you look at assets, those are the ones where you have the highest beta, beta right? So now with ordinals, because they do exist, because there are now 24 seven marketplaces for them, because there are now non-arbitrary values to certain collections, like it's changing the meta of Bitcoin itself and putting it as a, it's changing it to a storage network of assets that are valued. And those assets take the shape of art, culture, history, free speech, right? Music. Um, and those are societally valuable assets that are now stored on the Bitcoin chain. So these assets enjoy all of the robustness, all of the aspects of Bitcoin that I don't need to preach to to this audience already. And then on top of that, they, they become the primary high beta asset with probably what's going to be the highest shark ratio of any asset ever created in mankind's history. If you think about it, right? So I, like I'm zoomed all the way out. I can't sell my Bitcoin. I'm accumulating ordinals for about 20% of my entire portfolio. And for me personally, just so the audience knows, I'm so convicted in Bitcoin this cycle after 15 years being, well, I mean, I, I knew some of these folks like before Bitcoin was a thing, like Dan Kaminsky, and for, like I'm an old school hacker, right? So um, I should be careful what I say, but what I'm about to say is important because I've taken all of my retirement after 30 years in the tech industry, multiple exits, all of it is now in Bitcoin, 
right? I didn't do that for sake of greed or because this is a super cycle. I did that to protect my family's wealth and provide my protect my daughter's future, and that is it. It's out of fear that I did that. That is a very different story, even for myself or for anybody else, this cycle than it's ever been in Bitcoin's history. And I think that's kind of the biggest takeaway of why this cycle is different. Pixel, I think we might know each other in person, just we don't know that we know who we are. Uh, by the way, uh, sadly, um, speaking of OGs, uh, I don't know, if, did you know Brian Larkin? Yeah, uh, it's 2013 or... Uh, yeah, that name rings a bell. I'm trying to remember his handle, though. Um, I'm better with my candles and names at DEF CON than I am remembering a human name. <laughs> yeah, just uh, to, to, to show how far we've gone, he actually just uh, uh, mysteriously died. Uh, and I, I'm actually heading to Bali. To I was supposed to be visiting him. So uh, those were the, the uh, old days where back in Puerto Rico talking about... Uh, EOS and, 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 and Brock and kind of where this was going. And here we are now I, to hear that you put everything in, into Bitcoin. Um, honestly, doesn't not financial advice guys, uh, but doesn't actually scare me. Uh, I loved what you said about the, the kind of super cycle and, and adding uh, true value, right? Cause the easiest way for me to explain blockchain to people um, is I, I just say it's, it's time, right? Uh, it's literally just time. Uh, and if that's the case, then the more value we add to that time uh, culturally, and, and basically if you look at Bitcoin uh, as, as a vertical and you look at value propositions such as asset classes, uh, uh, energy, uh, art, culture as horizontals, right? It really just changed the way you look at what we're dealing with here. And it's things that, that the dollar really can't do, um, which, which makes it much more interesting. Uh, Andrew, I'd love to go to you and then we'll go to Lucas. Guys, I'm trying to go, go ahead, Pixel. Yeah, just one, one more thing I just want to tell the audience, right? Because I have a unique perspective. Digital sounds like it probably does too. But like there's, yeah, Bitcoin is a digital thing, right? And, and any, it's software. At the end of the day, it's a software. Um, and, and one of my friends, also rest in peace, Dan Kaminsky, um, was one of the first to inscribe on Bitcoin, but not in an ordinal sense. He literally just used ASCII art and did a, an art piece of Len Sassman, which some people actually think is Satoshi. But he's a cryptographer and a hacker. Um, he was good friends with my friend Meredith. Uh, they were together as husband and wife when he passed away. Um, but long story short, like the reason I had conviction in Bitcoin early on and I was blessed with that is that Dan Kaminsky is one of the smartest hackers ever to live. One of the most beautiful minds, a total savant, achieved more as a hacker than probably a thousand other hackers combined. He personally did not like that. And, and, a, good, and a good human, by the way. Oh my God. So if you, I just got chills. One of the most beautiful human beings you will ever know. The nicest, most genuine, biggest hugging, joyous person in the world. But he himself wrote a white paper after trying to hack Bitcoin itself for a long time. And he could not succeed. And that gave me my conviction to start mining in like uh, around 2014, 2013, 2014, I started mining, script mining and then Bitcoin mining. And I was submerging my miners in, in freaking mineral oil at the time, just trying to max out hash rate, right? Because I was trying to hack the entire system. Like, I don't look at Bitcoin as a monetary system, look at it as a crypto system, a software crypto system, right? And when you look at it through those lens, one time Dan and I were sitting at the pool, pool two, DEF CON, right? And, and, and I, I asked, he was asking me, so what do you think about Bitcoin? And I gave him all the normal answers. Decentralized is amazing, you know, proof of work, all, all of the kind of standard things you would expect, right? And he's like, no, you're, you're not getting it. Like, shut up. I was like, why? He goes, Bitcoin is nothing more and nothing less than the next internet. And it's an internet built in a way that the former internet, ARPANET, DARPANET, all of that evolved to this current set of protocols, right, that we have on the internet, what we call Web 2.0. It, it's the Bitcoin is a network built in a way that Web2 can never achieve. Like there's no amount of complexity, layering, reworking, um, bug fixing that the current internet can ever get to, to even approximate the strength and resilience and design, the design intent of the Bitcoin network. It's the next fucking internet. So when the DOD generals in the United States DOD write letters to OMB and Congress saying, the DOD, Department of Defense of the United States, needs Bitcoin as an assurance layer and root of trust for quantum compute 
an AI software being written to leverage quantum compute for national security reasons, it's for a reason. It's not arbitrary. It's not serendipity. And then you hear motherfuckers like Kramer on TV talking about like the value of Bitcoin is arbitrary. It's like tulips. Like the contrast between normies and people that actually know what time it is, is the entire spectrum of pendulum that there is. And we're here, we're lucky we're on this spaces right now. If you're listening to this right now, it's not necessarily that you're early, but you're more awakened. You, you can see the world differently for like what it is. And the greatest gift that Bitcoin has given to mankind is it provides a contrast for everything else that we've been living in, whether it's a financial system, it's a crypto system, it's a network, it's a trust system, it's a contrast for us to understand our, our past by looking at Bitcoin so that we can now understand our future. And that future is born out of necessity, motherfuckers. It's not born out of brilliance and creativity. It was born out of necessity. Dude, if you think you had chills, I just got chills. The, the, when I was talking about, and, and I did note, Dan, and the, I, I, don't, I don't often get to have these conversations, but... Um, yeah, but it's bringing me back to we, we weren't talking about the value of the tokens. We we were talking about uh, uh, freedom and uh, and and access to uh, immutable information uh, and and an instant and even access to to education, information, data, and that's really where we're at. But spaces like this, where I'm gonna, I'm going to push back. You guys are still you guys are still early. If there's still educating occurring. That means there's still growth to occur, um, and so educating yourself. Still. Right? Uh, I, I agree. I was talking about. I was talking to a veteran today, actually, over lunch, and we were talking about uh, uh, civil rights and stuff. And he grew up in the South, near Richmond, Virginia, and he didn't understand s separation. He didn't understand racism at that time. And I, I, I sat back and I went. Imagine if we had the internet. This is literally just access to information. And your reference to Bitcoin being the next internet is really just the next layer of information distribution and equal access to that if, if, you, if you choose to, to access it. Angel, this is infancy this stages really esoteric. Still. This is still infancy stages. We haven't even scratched the surface with it. I agree. I agree completely. And, and by the way, I, I believe that the, the, we're over that when Bitcoin isn't volatile and, and we're going to have stable values to a degree, or at least predictable values. And as we see ETFs pour in, we're going to see, you know, people hate regulation, people hate the ETFs, but it, it gives certainty and, and it gives growth. Uh, Andrew, well, we need smart way, regulation. Andrew, what's going on, brother? Yeah, we need smart regulation. At I agree. Regulation. Dude, we've seen, uh, we've seen an incredible increase in the it's been beautiful to watch the aptitude increase in terms of uh, our government. I, I can't believe I'm saying that, but they are advancing. I remember a couple of years ago, the hearings we would see were just like, they'd make me spit up my cereal. Um, and yep. the questions that we're seeing are advanced. So we are seeing growth. Yeah, they shut they shut down all those bills because they, they finally heard us. A lot of people called their, their local senators and their, their state councilmen and said, look, you guys are trying to write a bill, and nobody on that panel knows what they're talking about. So it completely got shut down, and they brought some people in to discuss it. Couldn't agree more, and, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but this starts at the local level, as does, every, as does all change, right? To grassroots is, is how movements uh, occur. So instead of trying to get uh, Congress to change bills, you get your, you, you get your, 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 your local... Uh, you know, your local town, your local city, your, your local province. Get and that's how the law is actually built. The but businesses to start recognizing it. And when they start recognizing it, they're the ones that have the voice and the power to get in front of council and say, look, I run a $12 million bar or I run a $15 million gas station a month and we're bringing in Bitcoin ATMs. We started seeing ATMs pop up left and right here in Michigan and down in Texas. Hey, Pidgeon, I'm low on battery. Can I steal the mic for like 90 seconds? Oh, go, go, go ahead, Walrus. Yeah, Andrew Lucas, sorry about that, guys. Yeah, um, so I'm actually down in El Salvador right now, um, setting up a few different things uh, personally and for the family. And you guys want to know why the cycle is different? Because I bought a dollar and 20 cent coffee this morning with lightning and didn't have to explain. 
Hey, guard BTC. T T. Pulls out from behind the counter. Boom. Just like that. No problem. No questions. No clarification. No tech. No what's lightning. No what address. Nothing. Literally just hey, what's up, guys? Boom. Paid for it. Sat out front. Smoked a cigar and drank coffee. Like this is a place where the day before, as I'm going through some residency, the government building didn't have a copy machine. The people who make the copies is a lady sitting outside with drinks in a cooler on her left and a copy machine on her right across the street from the government building. So that's, you know, there's some funny things about El Salvador where you're seeing these, where they're building new things and they have beautiful beaches and roads and these, uh, these uh, street lights that illuminate in the flag colors. Neat things are coming, but you still see where there's, there's still old things that haven't replaced yet. But all the cool things we talk about with Bitcoin, issue exchanges, none of it's here. And again, they're, they're, sometimes when you read the headlines, you'll make it think that it's more accepted. But it's here. Like most, like no one's like, what do you mean? They may not have it. They may be clunky with the wallets, but like you can use it all the time. Um, and like we're seeing a, like a beautiful level. So we always want this education. But there's almost another side of it is that when it stops needing education, and we don't mean because they're educated, we mean because it's so normal. Like people don't know how their debit card works, but they don't have to. Same thing. That guy doesn't know. That guy probably doesn't know what SAT stands for. He doesn't understand block confirmations. He doesn't understand the tech behind his wallet. The dude's got his SATs for, for the coffee this morning and an effortless transaction. Um, so like these things are growing so much in places that we don't see, especially for very like Western centric. So I don't want to cut in line. Just want to jump it out before my battery drops, guys. Well, I was real quick, that's why the Debbie, that's why the World Economic Forum doesn't want us, uh, Ecuador to succeed is because of what you said. It's not, it's, it's not even a macro thing. It's not a, a technology thing. It's literally because Lightning Network is very dangerous to, uh, to their agenda. And I think you just nailed it so well. I literally got chills everywhere you were saying. It's when it, it becomes transparent that it becomes magic. Well, you guys get a lot guys, of chills it in is. this room today. <laughs> guys it's it's like we get comfortable with it right like a lot of us here do business we build things we move around we do different things with it where you know if you know if if digital was like hey send me some bitcoin for something other he's not going to think twice right but when you're walking around and the people don't even speak english i barely speak spanish right like i speak it like you know a handful of words people you've never met doing normal business and then you get to pay with bitcoin it is a very it'll give you chills too right <laughs> the chills are the trend of the day like, it's different when you actually get to use this thing as commerce. Like, the, the way this stuff was written in white papers, the way we said this thing was going to be years ago, the way many of us kind of romanticized it, got made fun of for being nerds. Like, that stuff's a reality in certain places right now. Like, dollar twenty coffee. I'm not saying I made a deal with some big dealership for a car. I didn't make a deal on a house. I'm talking about walk up, no com- peg our BTC. J-C-C. And there it goes. Walrus, before you, before your battery dies, this is not my real beard. This is a Bukele beard. This is my old Bitcoin eyes picture, and I photoshopped the Bukele beard on it for a reason, and that's why I'm sporting it. And that's also another. I've, that was why I had my hand raised. That's why this cycle is different. Nice, brother. Yeah, man. And man, I don't care what anybody in any Western place says. I walked around here, and every everybody from the abuela on the corner. Uh, selling drinks or sweets to the guys who run businesses to the people in the rich spots in Costa del Sol and San Salvador. I haven't heard a single person say anything negative about Bukele. Like all that's that's all that's all propaganda, crazy stuff, man. Like the people love him down here. I walked around in a place um, where where I was getting some residents sent down yesterday. The translator came to help me get through things. I'm I swear he saw me wearing my headphones, which a lot of you guys are seeing my stuff, see me with, and he he kind of chuckled and I was like, what's funny? He goes, it's just funny, like, a gringo couldn't have walked around here a few years ago with, like, headphones like yours around here. Like, it would have been safe. And he knows it's different now, but, like, that was a jarring thing for him, right? Like, this is somewhere you just couldn't be like that. Like, white boy couldn't walk around here like that with anything. And I was just, oh, seems nice now. He's like, no, no, it is. But, that, like, that was a, a reminder for him, like, what, what some of the economic changes and the Kelly and things have done for the area here that a few years ago, gringo could just not walk around there. And I'm just standing around there looking silly, waving waiting on Jose to come over and translate. and um, So it's a beautiful country. That all of that stuff is really cool in, in, in El Salvador. But again, to the message of the room, like th- these are things that we've kind of said were true and were sort of true in certain ways. But rolling around here a few times a day, depending on what I'm doing, people I've never met, no explanation, pull out their phone, boom, lightning network and pay, guys. Like It's beautiful, man. It's a special thing.
and for the OGs, like this is the stuff we dreamed about. These were literally wet dreams that we never. But then there's stages, right? It was like, can we buy it with a credit card? Can we, can we send it you know, directly? So the fact that you're literally living, and I, I'm really excited about what what that means for trickle down. And I won't uh, I won't press you always because you, you do have uh, 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 battery stuff. I, I will go to Andrew and thank you all for coming up. And I'd love to hear the journey because um, that's that's a dream of mine as well. I'm actually stopping yeah. by Portugal to look at, uh, at citizenship. So very cool, Lu Lucas and Andrew. Thanks again, guys, for letting me hop in front real fast. Thanks, Wallace. Andrew, what's going on, dude? Let's yeah, hear. no, I mean, I, w I first just want to say, Pixel, I fucking love you. I mean, I already know you, but I love you. But um, I wanted to kind of go back to some of what he was talking about. Um, and, and also, I, again, like for me, I really, I research an insane amount. I'm very focused on like educating people and helping them become better traders. So I think like what I wanted to talk about is this notion of isolating forces. Um, I think it's really important, especially for new traders, to understand all the independent forces at play and then also be able to isolate them so that you understand why certain things are moving in certain directions, right? So, so I want to kind of get into this for a second. So, so on the Bitcoin front, <clears throat> yes, I do agree with you. I think I think we're in a Bitcoin super cycle. I think, you know, you're obviously seeing a lot of interest in BRC20s. You're seeing a lot of interest in ordinals. I do think that that is somewhat tied to what I call a regional force. Um, so if you're familiar with APAC trading, especially in mainland China, um, they tend to like very high risk opportunities. They tend to like to be very early on new things, and they tend to like new shiny objects. And so I do think in general, you're seeing a, a pretty decent amount of inflow towards 20s, you know, coming from APAC, right? Not to say that, you know, Bitcoin macro or, or other macros at play, but I do think that that's having a, a significant impact. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is like this notion of internal forces, right? So, so for internal forces, two examples to give you is if you look at the performance of say and pendle specifically, right? Yes, you could say, oh, you know, it's it's the reaction of Bitcoin to Ethereum to these, but again, you have internal forces at play, right? So so Pendle, which has been like one of my best runs, you know, they innovated the product, they aligned it with Eigenlayer. And so to an extent, what's happening around the speculation for Eigenlayer is obviously having a positive impact on Pendle, right? And this is what I'm talking about, like isolating forces. Another example I can give is when you look at say, like, yes, obviously there's a bit of an alt one narrative, but I would argue anyone that's been <clears throat> an investor of Injective, which is a purpose-built trading blockchain, probably looks at say as kind of a, a, a new asset in a similar category. And therefore they're probably, you know, rotating some profits into that or saying, Hey, I think I can repeat my I and J run with something like a say. Right. Um, and then other things I would just kind of call out, um, you know, AI, I used to work in AI at Amazon. I'm, I'm very, very familiar with AI and machine learning. Um, I also used to work with NVIDIA for years. And so I knew where this kind of, you know, macro stock AI stuff was heading. And so I bought a bunch of AI tokens a while ago. And one of them pumped, for example, like 3,200%. But I do think you have, again, like a, a macro impact of, of NVIDIA and AI in the stock market, obviously impacting AI tokens here, right? So I think, again, like you have to really take a step back. You have to do a lot of research. You have to really understand this stuff. But you can't just assume, okay, Bitcoin pumps, Ethereum points, all, you know, alt pumps, because you have these kind of outliers tied to other forces, whether they're, again, macro, external, internal, or regional, right? So I think it's just an important thing to, to really think about and, and do your own research on. But I, I do want to ask, what do you think, and this is not financial advice, what do you think the trickle down will look like? Um, just so people have perspective. Again, not financial advice. Yeah, uh, guys, do your own research. Andrew just said he does a shit ton of his own research. But yeah, what, yeah. What are I you mean, I, What are I, you thinking? I mean, it's really hard to say. I mean, obviously, like history repeats itself. I do think you're still going to see the same cycle. You're going to see, you know, you're going to see the flow into ETH, which I think we're already there. Then you're going to see, you know, the shift into alts. Then you're going to see the shift into NFTs. But um, the one thing I would call out is is my personal view had been, and, and I do have a lot of folks that I think agree with this, that we would probably really hit peak kind of mid 2025, right? And so it's, you know, to, going back to kind of what Pixel was saying, it's very early right now, you know, to see this cycle happen and to see alt season occur. And so, you know, even in my head, it's like, I wouldn't be surprised to see some sort of significant pullback and it, it might not happen, you know, quickly. Um, but again, I'm still in the back of my head saying, I think we top, you know, either Q1, Q2, 25. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. I, I think most of this, a lot of this, you know, I've always watched NASDAQ. NASDAQ's got a real 
a correlation with, with Bitcoin and then obviously everything follows behind Bitcoin uh, on a normal basis. Uh, outside of some other outliers like an Elon tweet on something else or something magical occurs. But I, I think right now we're, we're probably 80% into a almost a full bull run uh, within crypto. And I think it got triggered early through these approvals for these ETFs. And today's you know announcement with the, with the integration with Chainlink on Bitcoin, I mean, what, $67.8 billion in 24 hours uh, via Coinbase? That's a lot of volume. I mean, that's just a lot of volume. So I think after this halving comes up, which is supposed to be, what, April, May, or end of March, April, uh, and the rewards start dropping down, I think we're going to get a little bit of a lull there. But you're going to see people who have been holding on for so long take profits, which they should. And depending on quarterly makes and, and how much money they've got, how much Bitcoin they got, uh, you know, to subsidize their books, you know, most people are running two, three, and five percent max uh, in bitcoins on these corporations that are that are actually holding it. Outside of these large places like Sailor and those guys, uh, if they're in it, they're, it, it's a low low percentage, right? And depending on the volumes, if they need cash, you will see that movement like you did last year and the year before. Uh, but I think really the the real turnaround, like you said, first quarter next twenty twenty five is going to be all related to. And it's going to have the biggest impact on us uh, for a longevity perspective uh, after this election's over and we start getting people in office that are going to create smart regulation as opposed to overregulation. And I think that's just where I stand on it. Doc, welcome to the panel. Go for it. Hey, guys. Yeah, the thing that, that, uh, that I'm curious about is the notion that uh, the pull-up of, of Bitcoin and the tracking the same of ETH is going to translate down into ordinals or NFTs because that's what's happened in, in past cycles. I, I think this cycle is, is being driven almost entirely by Bitcoin and its potential acceptance, uh, and, and ETH too, I think, ETH, that's I predicted uh, back before the spike, that that ETH would would follow the momentum uh, once the ETF for Bitcoin was uh, was announced, follow the momentum in the market uh, as the next sort of opportunity uh, along the, the those lines. I, I just don't. Good see God, Doc! I've, I I agree with you for crying out loud. That's twice in a year. <laughs> uh, well, I, I just you know I'd love to see it because I have a lot of dear friends that are in NFTs. And, uh, and speculate uh, in some of the uh, smaller issues. I'd love to see it. I just don't see the attraction to the boomer market, which is what I see as chiefly responsible through the ETS of pulling up uh, the crypto market. So that's just... Well, I, I think that from an NFT perspective, just from where I stand, you know, uh, it's great that this art and these pixel arts and these NFTs and things like that have all come out because it's really brought a lot of a lot of uh, new retail into the market. And if they got in here after 2021, they got wrecked, right? Uh, some people made some money, but a lot of people pretty much got wrecked and they've been sitting for two years. Uh, but really, to me, it, it's about the technology and the smart contract behind Ethereum and NFTs. And I think it, it, I, I just don't see anybody outrunning uh, Ethereum. In that relationship uh, but the smart contracting we haven't even scratched the surfaces i think once they get a handle on that and i think they're waiting for this market to actually start get regulated smartly not over regulated i keep bringing that up and when we start seeing a more less volatile day by day and start seeing things that last as opposed to being in a in a bear market uh, for for two years we start seeing a, a less volatile market that will last, you know, a quarter or two quarters or even throughout the year where we're not seeing massive influx outside of some abnormal, you know, event. Uh, when we start seeing that, I think we're going to start see I think people have built stuff that we are not even aware of. They're doing it behind the scenes, just waiting for this to occur. And I think we're going to get bombarded with a lot of brand new tech, uh, hopefully, uh, within the next with, within the next two years, and I think it's going to come out. A lot of it's going to come out all at once. I think there are people behind her who are really smart, 
behind the scenes have been working on this during this entire bear market, and they're just waiting to pull the trigger. Yeah, I, you know, I know some of those people. Some of those people are in this room. Uh, yep. The challenge, the challenge there is, you know, as they have been waiting for a bull run, so is everybody else. So there's going to be a glut of product in the market. The the distinguishing factor is going to be the amount of financial resources each of those uh, those originators have and how they can market, uh, you know, to a to a what I see is a is a shrinking market in terms of new product offerings because people come have out now with something fresh. Yep, come out with something fresh, smart, something that's not been thought of, or even something that shows an improvement. Uh, and it's simple, and come out with transparency, and you'll be the leader in it. Yeah, I, I think what what uh, what will really gain traction is those products that can deliver uh, opportunities in investing in a real simplified form, whether that's through smart contracts or, or just ease of use for, again, the boomers, the people who are now uh, ready to explore uh uh, crypto investing with uh, with the uh, um, leadership of, of both uh, Bitcoin and, and ETH. And, and I will say that Fidgetal told me to go buy it uh, at the beginning of the year at 17. And I couldn't do it because my wife would <laughs> now divorcing my wife and uh, looking to see if I can collect damages for the lost uh, investment opportunity between uh, 17,000 and 60,000. Uh, any other uh, Listen, it, 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 who might want it, to assist me in that effort, uh, please go ahead and DM me, I appreciate it. I'm gonna say it feels good to be right. Um, but, it, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like spectacular to be right because for those who, who have conviction, this was again, inevitable. Uh, welcome back, Pixel. Uh, I'll go to Andrew, and by the way, for those like, I am, I, I've been, it's 1.30 in the morning here, and I have, I'm like on crack with, with the market right now. It is all over the place, and it's, uh, it's wild. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to correlate stuff, right? So I'm seeing Matic is, is, is dumping while, while Bitcoin is, is retracing, but then gaining back. The, the, and that's really what I, want, I wanted to talk about is kind of the, the interplay between things. Like, why, why are people making the decisions they're making at this exact moment, right? We are, for those in the audience right now, we are at a, a monumental inflection point right the fuck right now. Um, and I'm trying to make sense of what's happening. And that's really why I named the space what it is. Uh, Andrew, uh, you have your hand up. What up, brother? Um, yeah, I'm just making a note for myself. Uh, I, I can kind of point, I can talk about that for a second, but I wanted to actually give folks something else to, to look at. Um, I think you, I, <clears throat> there's not a ton of folks that do a ton of blockchain research. Uh, or excuse me, on-chain research, but I think part of it is you have to look at what the holder base composition looks like, right? And and what I mean by that, and I can give you a good example. So, you know, when I was at the CMO of, uh, CMO of Arbitrum, I have a pretty strong understanding of like what the Arbitrum community is, where they're based, you know, wallet sizes, things like that. Um, I can draw assumptions on other chains like a Polygon or, or, or even a, um, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm like half awake right now, or a uh, Solana, right? And, and if you look at Solana, obviously a little bit of a younger user base, um, a little bit, um, you know, and this, this kind of predates some of the recent changes, um, a little bit of maybe smaller wallet sizes. And so in general, you have a holder demographic that is more apt to take profits more quickly, right? So I think, I think these are some of the factors you have to kind of consider. Um, but anyways, what I wanted to get into, because I have to jump in a second, was I wanted, um, there was a conversation a little bit ago about, you know, how early we are and the impact on things and all that. And I wanted to give folks like three things to actually go look into and research, um, because I think these are three things that are going to have a pretty profound impact on the industry. Um, obviously, some of these are tied to narratives. Some of the, some of these are obviously projects that exist now, but I don't think that folks fully comprehend the impact of these things on, on macro. So the first one is um, the AI impact on DAP development. Like, dive into that. Once you understand how AI is going to accelerate and support DAP development, you'll start to understand how quickly these ecosystems are going to start to grow. Um, the second one, and I've, I've done some threads on this, is uh, the deep end impact on GPUs. If you understand AI and you understand how GPU intense these technologies are and you understand where GPUs are currently coming from and how that price model works, 
I think the, the deep end impact on GPUs is going to be enormous, both in Web3 and for Web2 companies. And then the last one is, you know, the modular impact on both scalability and DA. I think, candidly, if you go and you research those three things and you really wrap your heads around them, you're going to start to understand a little bit more of, of the macro forces at play and what could be coming you know, maybe not even in this cycle, but the next cycle. And I think these are things that folks should really dig into and be early on. So um, hopefully that's helpful for folks. No, thank you, Andrew. And, and uh, uh, look forward to catching up when I'm back. Uh, and I, I'm actually looking forward to distilling that into actionable information um, because you are fantastic at um, the, the super high level stuff that I feel like uh, we, we need some sort of Oracle filter to, to make sure that people can understand and, and, and kind of do the actual research. So I'd love to have you back and talk about like what those resources are, how you find them, how you build the, 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 the knowledge base and then navigate that process. So that um, I feel like that that's really, and Doc touches on this a lot, is, is we have our lingo, we have our jargon, we have our, our you know, our level of understanding and, and Often we talk in a way that it's, it's two cycles away from being able to even have a conversation. Um, and I think it's really important to bridge that gap for the, the broader adoption. And uh, we are ever closer, uh, and, and I know you'd agree, we are ever closer day by day to that, that, uh, that merging and, and that excitement. And for me, that's the excitement, right? Uh, what, what Walrus is talking about in terms of like actual use case that, that is a, an inflection or a reflection of, of, of information education. Um, people need to understand what they're doing. Uh, so this is financial advice. If you don't understand what you're investing in, uh, if you're going to do anything with crypto, do Bitcoin. Like the, the, that, is the, the, that is the tip of the arrow. Uh, if, if it fails, everything fails. So if, if you're, this is financial advice. If you're looking to play in this ecosystem, and you haven't done your research, don't meander, don't listen to your, your neighbor's crazy aunt who says that, I'm not gonna say it because Walrus is here, but that this crazy token is gonna change your life. It's not, um, you, you, I gotta give you, I gotta go give ahead, you the Andrew. best example. Of, I gotta give you the best example of what not to do. So I think it was like in the last cycle, there was a token, I believe it was called like Dentacoin or something like that. And basically the entire narrative was like the entire dental industry is going to run on Dentacoin. And I believe it was booming. And you just have to take a step back and just go, this is fucking ridiculous. Right. So You're listen, kidding to me. Fidgetal. <laughs> listen to Fidgetal. <laughs> there was a dental coin? Yeah, oh, Dentacoin. yeah, I've heard. It. Yeah, Dentacoin. Yeah. I remember. I mean, you got to be an OG to remember Dentacoin, but like, it's just a great example of like why you should do your own research. Um, and, and even going back to that 3,200% pump that I was talking about, I mean, I, I did a little post on this the other day, but I, I, I found that token very early. I had conviction. It wasn't moving. I just, I was patient, and sure enough, it exploded, right? And again, that came from doing a lot of research and a lot of deep diving. Um, it didn't come from someone telling me something was going to change the dental industry for good. <laughs> Bottom line so, is, and, is and, 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 doing... Andrew, so Uncle, 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 please, I actually, I actually want to just one, one second thought Robert, before Andrew leaves. Andrew, was that, thanks brother, I love you. Uh, was that conviction in the, in, in the utility or value of the token or in that people would come around and, and, and jump on board? The latter, the latter. Be honest. Yeah, the latter, because I think, you know, listen, I'm invested in <clears throat> a number of AI projects and, you know, I can tell you, you know, one AI project has an executive from DeepMind, which is Google's AI team. There's another AI project that actually was a technology that existed in Hollywood for years that rebranded that I, I, I swear I'm like one of two people that knows about this. Um, so there are projects that I've done a ton of research on and I've invested in, and I'm not looking for hundred X's on these. I'm looking at these as long-term investments, but then I'm also taking a step back and going, all right, well, you know, you know how these forces work, you know, the second the AI stuff starts exploding on the back of NVIDIA, you know, everything's going to explode. And then the small cap gems or maybe things people are less aware of, you know, people will start researching, they will start becoming aware of them. Folks will start talking about them. So again, it's that notion of, of being early, um, 
you know, I wouldn't, especially for small caps, anything under 50 million, I still always do research. I'm not going to buy a token that could turn into a rug, but maybe I'm a little less critical about, you know, the founding team or the roadmap or things like that. And I'm, and again, I'm more bullish on, you know, the macro forces at play. And, th and that's kind of where I was going is guys understand how, pe understand how people are investing. So to be clear, and, and, and there's no shade whatsoever. You're wearing Camp I Panda, and you're making the same <laughs> bet as what we're talking about. Which, by the way, I got my <laughs> it's Panda true. $300. There you go. <laughs> and, and, and it's worth how much now? Uh, I don't know, but I think it, like at one point it was like $3,000. Um, i am not going to sell it, but like I'm, I have pretty strong conviction. And that came from a lot of research also. I literally I kicked myself because there was a day where I was going to buy that and a Pudgy for, I think, $600. I just bought one instead of both. I should have bought both because we've seen what happened to Pudgy. But again, my thesis against both of those was very similar. And, and the research that went into both of them was very similar. And, and I think even just going back to what you're saying, um, you know, I've talked about this before, how I take a little bit more of this like mutual fund approach, which I know is not as popular in the industry. But again, you know, my bags are up 40%. I'm very happy with that. And then going back to what you were saying, I, you know, there, there's two types of things I'm looking at. I have certain tokens that I'm investing in from a long-term perspective where, again, I don't really care if I'm seeing these mega pumps. And then there's other tokens that I'm investing in for short-term gains, right? And I don't mix the two together, right? So when those short-term gain tokens take off, you know, I might pivot my profits into some of those long-term tokens that still have upside potential, maybe less. But again, I'm more bullish on them from like a 10-year time horizon versus, you know, one super cycle.